the examen. It is on, right? Okay. So again, membrane prediction is, an, is a particular example where we have very few structures. We can do very little in the prediction of structure, but we have a strong incentive to predict aspects, and we can predict where the helices are and how they are oriented. Uh, second type of membrane proteins are the beta barrels, the porins, and again, you can. I said you can build. Uh, model that essentially uses a Bayesian network or a hidden Markov model uh, to model the strands going up and down. And uh, I, we, we talked about the problems to assess such a model if you have very little data. We found that in fact it, it has a remarkable performance and we applied it to entire uh, data sets and, and, and got some results and I'm going to skip that. What I do want to get into is solvent accessibility. Uh, the way we get solvent accessibility from 3D structure, so this is supposed to be a protein here. Uh, the, the coloring is a little bit off here. This is supposed to be the inside somewhere. Uh, so residues A to G are the proteins, uh, the residues in a protein. And the seven residues, up there you see a water bowl. And the way you compile solvent accessibility is essentially you roll the water bowl over the protein and ask what is what fraction of the water bowl is accessible or what fraction of the residue is accessible. In this image that I show here, uh, water could come in here. Here's a hole. Proteins do have holes. They are energetically not favorable, but they have surprisingly many holes. Uh, but this part here, so again, assuming that this, this, the, I have to um, add to the slide, so here are more residues, so since there are more residues here, no, even if there wouldn't be residues, if that would be a protein that is sort of strange like that, a peptide, even then the water bowl couldn't get in. So, um, C, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, see, I'm, I'm happy that, that some people are, are tired. This is, I believe, why I'm, why I'm just a personal conversation at this moment. Uh, so, in, in this model here, C is entirely conserved. Uh, sorry, entirely buried. While A, B, E, F, G are somehow accessible to water, and some of those are more accessible than others. Okay? And this is essentially exactly how you compile it. So, that means the absolute accessibility is compiled as a square angstrom. So again, one angstrom is a nanometer, is 0.1 nanometer, and square simply because you roll it over it. Uh, so again, you, the way you join, this is an amino acid, you join amino acids uh, over the backbone, these are the side chains, this builds up the polypeptide chain, uh, shown here again. And now some side chains are long, the lysine here. Again, this part here is the backbone. It's always the same when you look at them. And some side chains, alanine that's, or glycine, that explains why they are so flexible, are short. Now, in the sense of long and, and short side chains, you could imagine that the degree to which it stands out, to which it can reach solvent, actually differs. So maybe if you put the long side chain down here, the long side chain still couldn't reach water. Yes, the water ball couldn't reach C, the backbone of C, but there is something sticking out here while possibly B has such a short side chain that although, well, B is not a good example, but, but D or, or something that, that in fact hardly can touch or that, that is very close to the water can not touch it because it's too short. And that you could measure by in fact having essentially a different maximal volume by rather than measuring the, pers uh, the pair, uh, square angstrom, you would measure a percentage. Where in this percentage you say, so the maximal surface that you can fill is this, and this one here for the short side chain is that. So for that side chain, alanine for instance, uh, this is 100%. For lysine, this is 100%. So we redefine 100%, and you simply do not ask what's the accessible area, but what's the percentage of the side chain that somehow can access. And if that percentage is zero, then they are equally not accessible to water. 
right? If we use the same ball for both, somehow the ASA, the absolute value, would not completely measure the degree to which this can actively participate in, in touching a substrate. That's the idea behind it, okay? Um, we could have different states in which we measure solvent excitability. We could just say, you know, there are residues that are buried, and there are residues that are exposed to something else. What is the best of all of these criteria? How would I decide? I want to predict solvent excitability. Now I, I just showed you a couple of values. Square angstrom, percentage solvent excitability, states buried versus exposed. What is best? Here comes an additional problem. Uh, the additional problem has to do with the fact 100%, let's just say, for instance, uh, with a percentage value, 100% exposed, 80% exposed is much more similar to each other than 20 and 0. The reason being that 180 ah, is essentially both accessible. 0 is 0 and 20 is possibly somehow accessible. Okay, in some sense, in this image here, uh, whether you're F or G, you know, doesn't make a big difference. But C versus E, or E possibly even versus D, that does make a difference. Although the actual difference here, 20 units, 20 units, is the same. They don't mean the same. So, if that is the case, somehow we have to model that into the system of prediction. How could we do this? How could we choose First of all, how could you approach this reality? What could you put into the measuring as a function? Minimum threshold. Hmm? Minimum threshold. Above that only you consider the accessibility. So that essentially is the solution of states. Uh, but at this point, let's assume, I, I believe, yes, that's true. But where would you put the states? Oh, one state, well, one threshold, then you put it at 20, and then you say everything above 20 is. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if I put a range of like 60 to 100 is okay, so anything. Fair enough, fair enough. So I have classifications. So another way of, you're right, uh, let me get a little bit quicker through this. You could have a square root function that would essentially model something like that. You could come, you could invent a function, a simple function that would somehow reflect the observation. Now, how would you observe? How is the thing? How can you observe what is needed? Um, essentially, what you would do is you would look at proteins that have similar structures. So you take two proteins, you align them in 3D, and in 3D alignment, you say they are the same. Ah, okay. Now take these two and ask, okay, these are th 3D the same. What about the solvent accessibility assignment? How similar is that? Right? From the 3D object, you can simply measure what's the similarity in solvent accessibility. And what you want to predict is something that sort of reflects the difference between matching two things that are similar or matching two things that are not similar. Right? So in one case, I look at the solvent accessibility similarity between two structures that are alike, and another one I look at two structures that are completely different. And I want to have a prediction method that, or a measure for solvent accessibility that takes these two extremes apart, right? Somehow, when I predict solvent accessibility, it should tell me something about the similarity of structure. Right? Are you with me on this, or is, uh, am I in no man's land? Am I in my own universe here? I lost you, right? Um, okay. You said we can classify into different states. And let's get a few slides back. Uh, because I insist that I want you to understand the, the idea behind this. Forget about the square root part that will come in the actual solution. I no longer want you to understand that one. But the idea is important. Uh, so I have three different ways of measuring solvent accessibility. I can look at square angstrom. I can look at percentage. And I can look at states. I want to predict solvent accessibility, and my question is, which one of those should I use to train a machine learning device? How would you decide on, the, on that question? Yeah, we'd ask your supervisor, but your supervisor is gone. There's something else. And your thesis has to come to an end. 
So you have to make a decision. So you ask the guy next to you or the, the lady next to you. Um, but they don't know. Try to do both. Google. Google also doesn't help you. So nobody helps you. You have to do it yourself, is, is ultimately. So what can you do? If we have enough time, we can just try both and then attempt and then? to assess. And then? And then attempt to assess somehow. Okay, okay. Now we're getting to the point that I really want to. That is, that is the issue I'm after. How do I assess it? Database and see what their relationship so you do it on the part uh, but I thought I thought I lost you guys so I kept one as un unfortunate uh, <laughs> uh, before we get that before we get to that point uh, you're on the, on the trace to to the solution but before we get to that point how do you assess so I have two different methods one predicts let's just make it simple here percentage and one uh, or oh, three Square angstrom, percentage, two state buried versus exposed. How do I assess which one is better? Because ultimately that's the question you're asking, right? Well, I don't know, try some cross validation on a huge data set. Yes. Yes, and then you get some numbers. What do you believe you get? So, uh, say, for the pairwise, the Q2, you get 75 percent. For uh, the percentage, the relative accessibility, you get a correlation of 0.3. For the ASA, you get a correlation of 0.25. That's a fair statement. Uh, so which one number do I put down so that you don't feel fishy? Well, the, the best one. It just looks, I don't know, to, to power for 75%. Two? To power for 75%. Ah, so don't forget, the random is 50. It's a two-state model. It's not that bold. But okay, 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 okay. Let's, let, let's, not, let's not fight on this. <laughs> is that okay for you? Okay, so now which method is best? Sorry, may I ask why for random we have 50 percent? I mean, yeah, it's not quite true. Uh, but roughly we have two states, right? Well, They're not equally populated. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. That depends on where you put the threshold. So I put the threshold, actually, historically, this is indeed what people did. Uh, I put the threshold exactly where half of them are exposed and half of them are buried, and then you have exactly random 50 percent. Yes, that is the case, but for the other two types of measurement? In this particular case, it, it really is the case. And it happens to be, uh, by the way, if the relative solvent accessibility is, by, I believe, above 20%, uh, then half of the residues by that measure are exposed. And that is something that many people have done in the past. But I want to go back to your idea. So I have these three different methods. I had enough time to try them all. And this is another thing. When you design, when you, when you design, when you decide what you want to do, the question is which one to use. And now you think it through first. When you think it through, just get to the point where you imagine you get the results, and see what you learn from it. So think. The, the only point where you really, be, at some point, you're going to program, and then thinking is over. You're just going to be a slave of your fingers. Uh, but the thinking part, the design part, is really a lot about. What would that lead to? What would I learn if I really got the optimal result? What would I benefit from that? Think it through as far as you can, any project you do. So we are in this project. What did you learn? So you would possibly tend to argue, OK, at least these two numbers I cannot compare, because I cannot compare a correlation with a percentage number. And since it's a state system, the correlation doesn't quite make sense. So actually, the problem here is I have different measures for performance. And there is no trivial way of getting them to communicate with one another. How could you make them communicate? But before we get into that question, uh, these two appear to be both correlation. And these two appear to be more comparable to each other. And there you may be inclined to say, OK, this one is better. But that brings me back to the other question. 
how could you possibly hope to see which of these values is higher, although one is a percentage value and one is a correlation? You cannot translate them one into the other. What could you try to do? Map them into reality by looking at the proteins which have a similar structure. That's a great idea, but I'm, I'm completely confused why you have that idea. That's the idea for a biologist. Yes, that's exactly what a biologist would do. Uh, but you typically would use a computer, right? Actually, I mentioned this thing by computer. Yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> yeah, but his idea started with you have a thousand proteins. Okay, good luck. <laughs> um, but you are right. So that's a great solution. In fact, th that you absolutely should should do to see maybe show some examples where it works and show some examples where it doesn't work and then see the difference and you, you have to look only at four examples and you could possibly learn something from that. True. But I meant something else here. Let's think about the thousand. Sorry? What if we use the structures that are already in protein? That's essentially what he says. So you take the structures for which you know the answer and in fact you need the structures for which you know the answer in order to know that it's 70% right. So write with respect to a test set where you know the answer. Now you only know the answer when you have a 3D structure. Okay? And then he said, yes, take the known structures and really look at where do your predictions that are right. 70% right means 30% wrong. Where do the right ones the wrong ones fall? Is it sort of interesting what you get? Is it somehow spread over the structure? Do you, where do you make the mistakes? Is that, um, do you see maybe always the mistakes on the surface, on the inside, or what, what else do you see, right? Uh, but before we get into that, again, how could you possibly hope to unify, in some sense, two different sets of numbers? Percentage, correlation. Not realize somehow. How? Uh, convert, like 70% accessible, right? So you know the entire length of the say the protein and 70% accessibility will convert into some number? Yeah, 70%. No, 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 the number in Armstrong. It will convert into some number in Armstrong and then you compare. You mean this and that? No, uh, I mean the 70% and the 0.3 or 0.25. Anyway. So you normalize all them into one... Uh, no, that doesn't con con convert into... Uh, accessibility is ultimately the part, ah, part which is accessible. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Everybody follows on that idea? It didn't occur to me. It's a very crude model because essentially in this particular case here uh, you, you would sum for every single uh, prediction of uh, exposed you would sum a range between 20 and 80 uh, between 20 and 100 so a range of 80, 80 percentage points and on the other end you would sum a range of 0 to 20 20 percentage points. So it's a very complicated thing to do that sum that you're talking about. Um, I actually don't know where that would end you. Uh, th this is an idea, in that sense, if, if for this particular model here of two states, I, I never followed it up. I followed something like that up on a 10 state model, uh, but not for the two state model. Never had that idea. I don't know whether it would work, so I can't. But I meant there's something else here. Uh, the important part here is, again, you need two, you know, whatever number you have, you need to put it against the background. And there are two aspects to the background. One is low, and that's random, or something like random. So what's the worst you can do? In this particular case, random. Um, and then it's high. So the high story gets me back to what I said before. 100%, uh, if you look at the percent, is not necessarily what you can get. If the precision, for instance, of an experiment is not supporting 100%. Say somebody does the experiment twice and the solvent accessibility agrees only by 95%. Then a reasonable top point is 95, not 100. When you look at things that have the same 3D structure, different sequences, and you can do comparative modeling. We are talking about a 1D prediction method. You don't want to be as good as, as predicting as comparative modeling. So you will never beat with a 1D method you're developing a method for when you cannot do 3D modeling and comparative modeling. So, see how well would comparative modeling do? That defines another one of the, the, the top you can reach. If comparative modeling can only reach 90%, then your simple 1D method will not reach higher. Okay? And somehow, the frame between these two, in this particular case, the answer is in fact uh, 85 
in percentage terms and random is in the ballpark of 50. So now you can try, try to take these correlations here and put it into the same interval of what is top, what is lowest. And then see with respect to where the point is in that interval, that point is with that interval, you have a relative point of what you measure. That's one way in which you could try to compare. In fact, that's the only reasonable way in which you can compare, other than that you look at structures and find immediately something useful. Um, and that, I believe, is a very, very important concept. Um, and that's what I meant before. You can now, thinking this through, you can try to see, in some sense, what way of measuring solvent accessibility makes these two things become different. So that when you throw in random sequences, random proteins, they look different by the 1D measure. When you throw in things that are related in 3D, they look similar. And in some sense that means like finding some interval that is optimal, uh, optimally spread in some sense. Anyway, let's go over it. Uh, so there is a method that uses uh, the same kind of idea that I had before. So you use evolutionary information, you predict solvent accessibility, and here the solution is in 10 states. 10 states, uh, again, because there's a square root function and because you have more precision, more precision down here, less, less exposed, that is a percentage exposure. Uh, and then you get some percentage accuracy, and the percentage accuracy, in fact, is 75%. Just <laughs> to make that point. Uh, round about for a two-state uh, situation is really is about 75%. Uh, it sounds officially right, high, yeah? Uh, okay, in this particular case, by the way, uh, you can never train to more than 80% or something in the ballpark of 80% because again, the problem on the evolutionary conservation sense is not defined much better than 80%. So when you look between structures that are similar in 3D, you still have a difference in, second, in solvent accessibility. And that explains why you cannot fully train it. Um, okay. Um, let me just show you an example here, how you then, once you have solvent accessibility, how you can use it. This is a method called CONSERVE that uses 3D structures. Uh, it's from the group of um, near Bental in Tel Aviv. There is another version of that that is called SEC that uses really, that predicts it from sequence. What you simply look at, what they look at in CONSERVE, is they look at a 3D structure and they color the 3D structure according to conservation. Conservation means you build a sequence family. That was your question before, how do I build a sequence family? You find domains, you find the overlap between regions, you call it domain, and then you find everything that matches that domain. And then you ask, how much in that particular residue is conserved in that domain? Okay, The more red, the more conserved. And immediately looking at it, somehow you may suspect that what you actually look at here is a binding site. That's 100% right. So you look at the surface, you look at the patch on the surface that is conserved evolutionarily in the family, and you see a binding site. That is one example uh, how such a feature here again is the cavity that is conserved and that is another binding site. Uh, how you can use uh, solvent accessibility for, um, for, for inferring some aspects of function. Um, I believe I believe I will never get to the uh, disorder prediction. <laughs> This is remarkable because somehow in the beginning of the semester uh, the, this lecture went so fast